Hi there. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, the gastrointestinal manifestations of food allergy, which seems to be um, prominent in people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome. Uh, and uh, in terms of diagnosing food allergies, Pam alluded to this, that uh, diagnosing a food allergy um, is a little trickier than just a blood test, just a number, um, just a skin test. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is that um, gastrointestinal uh, food sensitivity comes in two flavors. So. Um, You've heard of immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins come in a couple flavors. One of those flavors is IgE. Uh, and uh, uh, IgE uh, mediated allergies, those are the immediate ones. That's the child or the person who eats the peanut and immediately has the trouble breathing, gets the rash all over their body. Um, they can also come as non-Ig mediated and, and you can't test for these. So when you do a blood test or do a skin test, what you're doing is you're testing for IgE mediated reactions. Again, that's the immediate systemic reaction, the rash, um, someone who eats a peanut or a, a milk and immediately starts throwing up. However, non-IgE mediated allergies, those tend to be more chronic, so they don't depend on uh, a preformed antibody. It's more a general reaction of the immune system, and that tends to lead to more chronic symptoms because they don't happen immediately, and also it's harder to put them together because it's not the child who has the glass of milk and immediately starts vomiting. It's the child who has the glass of milk every day, and then over a period of years, they start complaining about their belly hurting all the time, or they just don't grow well. So uh, with these types of allergies, typically what you see are chronic symptoms. Pain, vomiting or diarrhea that's not um, related to the specific food. It's just sort of, yeah, they just kind of throw up a lot. Um, and then poor growth. Um, sort of sitting in the middle, somewhere between IgE mediated and non-IgE mediated, is something called eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. And I'll talk about that in a second. So um, White blood, so there are in your body, there are red blood cells and white blood cells. There are other kinds of cells in your blood as well, but we'll focus on those. The red cell blood cells carry the oxygen and the white blood cells help you fight infection. Um, white blood cells also come in several flavors. One of those flavors is an eosinophil. <clears throat> Um, and uh, this eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, which I'll talk about, sits somewhere between in that it's partially IgE mediated and partially non-IgE mediated. So tests can be helpful, but um, not completely. So eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, again, eosinophils are a type of white blood cells and it's associated, these are the cells that are associated with allergic disease. Um, they're also associated with parasitic infections, but we don't have a lot of those in the United States, so almost exclusively they're associated with allergy. Uh, um, and wherever your body is encountering a substance it's allergic to, these move into the tissue um, and cause inflammation. Um, and for foods, the most common place you see this type of inflammation is in the esophagus, in the food pipe, because obviously that's the part of the body that has the highest exposure to the food proteins before they've been acted on by the acid and the digestive enzymes in the stomach. So what are the symptoms of eosinophilic esophagitis? And we'll abbreviate that EE. So um, in very young children, uh, basically it's um, a child who has um, very bad spitting up, not normal baby spit up, much worse than usual. Um, uh, reflux, significant vomiting, um, or they seem to be complaining, uh, have belly pain all of the time. Older children will complain of trouble swallowing or food getting stuck. Um, they'll also complain of chest pain as well. And at any age, um, diarrhea, it, it affects the esophagus, but actually one of the symptoms is diarrhea um, and trouble gaining weight um, or they're actually losing weight. Um, so from our study and looking at eosinophilic esophagitis in people with Lowy's Dietz, it appears to be about 500 times more common than in the general population. That seems like a big number, um, but the number is um, uh, about 15% uh, in uh, Lowy's Dietz, um, people with Lowy's Dietz. So, so how do you diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis? Unfortunately, at this time, the only way to diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis is with an endoscopy with a biopsy. So that's why under anesthesia, uh, a gastroenterologist will uh, go down with a scope and look at the esophagus and take a biopsy, which is a little bit of tissue that they look at under the microscope. Um, these are unfortunately at slightly different uh, powers, but this is a normal esophagus here. And if you sort of count little dots on your way from this, uh, this layer to the surface, 
oh, you get about 10 or 12 dots. Um, and if you count dots on your way from here up to the surface, you can see there's a lot more. So what you can see is um, there's thickening and swelling in the esophagus. And if you look at it under higher power, these colors are not coming up as well as I'd like, um, but I believe you can see all these bright pink cells in the purplish pink cells, those are what eosinophils look like. They're very bright cells. They uh, migrate and infiltrate into the layer of the esophagus, um, and they uh, release their inflammatory mediators from the cell, and they cause inflammation, swelling. They make it hard for the esophagus to contract to push food down. That's part of the food getting stuck in the pain. Um, and since your body is spending so much time on this inflammation, uh, it's hard for it to have the energy it needs to grow because all of the energy is being subverted for this inappropriate inflammation. Um, so there are treatments for eosinophilic esophagitis and the treatments for people with low esteets are not different than they are for the general population. Um, one is acid suppression that actually doesn't do anything to treat the EE, um, but it does make um, people with eosinophilic esophagitis more comfortable um, by reducing the amount of acid reflux they have. Um, the cornerstone is dietary modification and that involves um, figuring out what food is causing the inflammation uh, and eliminating it from the diet. Again, um, as uh, Pam discussed, um, that can be tricky and it's not as simple as sending a blood test for allergies and just getting rid of anything you're positive to. Um, uh, there are medications you can use. Um, for severe exacerbations, you, you can take systemic steroids, so like prednisone, for short periods of time to get things under control. Uh, and typically, if it's not a food, um, eosinophilic esophagitis can be triggered by, for example, pollen in the air that sticks to your, uh, the, your saliva or in your mouth and you swallow it and that causes the inflammation. Um, and uh, there are some topical swallowed steroids you can do that don't get into the, the body to have the side effects that can be used to treat it. Uh, I'm going to just touch briefly on that there are other types of intestinal inflammation. Um, we have seen a few um, people with Lowy Dietz syndrome who had severe allergic inflammation in their intestines and that over time this inflammation evolved to look less allergic looking um, and a type of inflammation that typically does not respond to changes in the diet. Um, these patients had very severe abdominal pain, they had severe diarrhea and vomiting and most importantly one of the red flags would be they had blood in their stool. Um, these are uh, people that eventually became diagnosed with something called inflammatory bowel disease. Um, uh, which is an inappropriate inflammatory condition where you have sort of a constant inflammation in your intestines that's not related to a food you're eating. Um, and this appears to be um, about a thousand times more common in Lois Dietz syndrome than in the general population. It's still very rare, uh, um, but uh, does tend to be more, uh, we do believe it is more common in Lois Dietz syndrome. Um, uh, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about this more uh, at the end of the talk um, if they feel that um, they would like to. So um, from this uh, study that we've, uh, you were all kind enough to help us out with, um, we found that Lois Dietz syndrome is associated with allergic disease and all kinds of allergic disease, including seasonal allergies, asthma, eczema, and food allergies, and also associated with intestinal inflammation, the most common being a type called eosinophilic esophagitis, or EE. Um, so that's the what. Um, and what um, we're working on now is the why. So um, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of um, other studies and experiments on animals um, that would make us believe that the TGF-beta pathway would have a role in this inappropriate inflammation. And so what we've been working on over the last few years is to answer why does this happen in people with Lowy Dietz syndrome and what can this tell us about the TGF-beta pathway. Uh, so um, I need to take a, a second to take a slide to just talk about the immune system quickly. Um, so white blood cells, I said they come in several flavors. One of those flavors was the eosinophil that we talked about. Another flavor is a T cell. T cells job are to um, identify invaders so the immune system knows what to attack. Um, but T cells need to be taught and they need to be taught what your own body looks like so that that they don't tell your immune system to attack yourself. The way they go to school, the where they go to school, what they're taught is in an organ called the thymus. Your thymus is, lives in your chest, sitting right above your heart, and that's the T-cell school. That's where they learn, where they're taught, this is your own body, don't attack it, anything else, go get it. 
Um, unfortunately, not everything your body is going to encounter is in the lesson plan in the thymus. For example, there's no peanut in your thymus. So the T cells have never seen a peanut before. So when they get out of the body, if you eat a peanut, as far as they're concerned, that's an invader and it needs to be attacked. So there, there needs to be some other way for the cells that are recognized these substances to be turned off. Um, uh, those are a set of cells, they're called regulatory T cells, and they're sort of the traffic cops um, of the T cells. So their job is to find cells that are doing bad things, that are attacking your own body or attacking things they're not supposed to and turn them off. Um, so um, we abbreviate them called T regs. So um, we can look specifically, so um, white blood cells, they have little flags sticking up off of them and we can look at these flags um, to tell what kind of flavor of white blood cell this is. So we look at these cells with an instrument called um, a flow cytometer um, and interestingly we found that people with Lewy's teeth syndrome actually have too many um, regulatory T cells, which is opposite of our hypothesis, opposite of what we were thinking. So where are we going with this now? So um, now we are looking at these. So are there too many because people with Lewy's teeth syndrome, the regulatory T cells that they make, they don't work quite right. And so the body is responding by making more, say, okay, well, it kind of works, so if I just make enough of them, we'll be able to get to where we need to be um, and turn off these inappropriate immune systems. So what we're doing now is we're looking at these regulatory T cells and seeing if they are able to do the job that they're supposed to do. So the other thing we're doing is we're also looking at uh, what happens to the signal after um, TGF-beta binds to the receptor. What happens inside the white blood cell? So this purple is a white blood cell. Um, uh, this is the TGF-beta receptor. This is where the mutation is in Lewis dietz syndrome. This is where the genetic ch the change in the protein is. Uh, and this is a, a, a molecule on the inside. It's called SMAD. That's not the important part. Um, uh, Dr. Dietz had, did have some of these in his slides. Um, but what happens is when TGF-beta binds to the receptor, it turns on a little switch here and it turns, uh, makes these, this pro signaling protein on the inside of the cell go from um, off to on. And once it's on, it can go and carry that signal to the rest of the cell. And that's how the cell knows that TGF is bound and um, it needs to do something different because TGF beta is around. So what we did is we were able to take white blood cells um, and expose them to TGF beta. So we were able to take human blood we were able to add TGF beta to it and look at the response of the white blood cells uh, by looking at the amount of this turned on, this green active SMAD protein. And so what we were able to find, so this is, this on this axis is the amount of active SMAD protein, uh, and this is minutes after exposure to TGF beta. So this is going out to about four hours. Uh, and um, this is a um, actually a relative of someone with Lewy state syndrome. Um, and you can see that there is a response to the TGF beta, um, and the amount of um, active SMAD protein does go up inside the cell after that. And then we looked at a person with Lowy Steed syndrome who had not started on Losartan yet, and you can see that there's um, a very a much increased activation of these proteins on the inside. So it appears that um, the change in the protein in Lowy Steed syndrome, um, as um, this correlates nicely with the uh, the data that Dr. Dietz had put up here is that there seems to be overactivation of this pathway. Uh, so what happens when you start on uh, Losartan? So we, this is a, a different patient, not the same patient, but this is a different patient who was on um, uh, who was on Losartan when the blood sample was taken, um, and um, it appears to normalize the the signal. Again, this goes along very nicely with the data from um, that Dr. Dietz showed you. Um, this data here is um, less than 48 hours old um, that we were able to do because um, people coming for the conference were kind enough to volunteer um, for us to be able to do these studies. This is very preliminary data. Um, I don't have enough, pay I need enough people in each of these groups or we need, oh, I'm in trouble now. We need um, uh, enough people in each group um, uh, to be able to have a graph that um, other scientists and other doctors will look at and believe. So one patient, one person in each group is not enough for doctors or scientists to believe. We need several people in each group. So